You've been waiting all week for that Saturday show. Tune in, see what happened, let your troubles go. Work real hard, now it's time to take it slow. Kick back and relax with that Saturday show. Good morning, Albuquerque. It's time again for that Saturday show. Welcome back. I'm Jim Harvey, your host. And just a little note, it's springtime. I'm doing my gardening. It's a wonderful time in Albuquerque. In fact, my wonderful niece is visiting me from Illinois. And the trees and the shrubs that I'm going to be planting are all set to go. And the good thing is we enjoy coffee on the terrace. <laughs> Every lovely Albuquerque morning. We've got a great show ahead for you featuring updates of the recent legislative session with a focus on the cannabis bill that got passed, although we're still waiting, still waiting. And we'll have music by Cheryl Sharps. And of course, you don't want to miss Good News News. So let's get started with our bulletin board where exciting things are happening. Earth Day is April 22nd, but most people will be observing this important date on April 24th, which is a Saturday. For example, the Peace and Justice Center will have wildflower seeds available. So stop by on the 24th. We'll be out in the parking lot passing out wildflower seeds. Come and get yours. La Montañita Co-op will host its 30th annual Earth Fest Redux on the 17th and the 24th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Make it over there, too. There's always something good happening. Combatants for Peace will be holding the largest Palestine-Israel peace event on April 13th at 1.30 p.m. For more information, contact Beth, B-E-T-H, at A-F-C-F-P dot org. The BIPOC Caucus on Climate Justice is offering a web conference on April 22nd at 6 p.m. For more information on this, Contact the Peace and Justice Center for registration. That's one you don't want to miss. I enjoy my spring, and climate justice is part of having a great spring, and so we want you to continue to have great springs. Mayor Tim Keller has finally announced the opening of the Gateway Center. What is the Gateway Center? It's the old Loveless Hospital on Gibson, and he is turning it into a facility to accommodate the various needs of our homeless populations. There's going to be housing there. There's going to be social services there, behavioral health services, physical health services, all under one roof. And the great thing that we're looking for is as the center begins to open, we're asking the mayor and we're asking the people that are running the center to take a moment and to connect with community-based organizations like the Peace and Justice Center and so many others that serve the homeless populations, the unhoused populations here in Albuquerque to help us link with the Gateway Center. When people come in our doors and ask for services, we should be able to sit them down and tell them what to expect when we refer them to the Gateway Center. Complete an application in advance for some type of service and go over there and know exactly where to take it so you don't spend all day waiting. We want that to happen and so we expect to have this dialogue and this exchange of ideas to, in, as to how we can make the Gateway Center work better in the future. We're excited about that. The Gateway Center is a huge facility. Did we have a picture of it up earlier? I thought we did. Yes, there it is. Right over there on Gibson. 
and um, we expect lots of good things to happen as a result of that. Finally, something exciting and positive is happening with our unhoused, our unhoused population here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then Georgia on my mind, a new campaign to support work against voter suppression in Georgia, and as many as 43 Republican-led states will launch on April 23rd. You'll hear more about it then. So stay tuned as the Peace and Justice Center rolls out a range of opportunities for everyone to get engaged in this important struggle for justice. I feel like I'm going back in a cycle here. I was doing this years ago, registering people to vote, fighting for the rights for people to vote. And here we are, back in this again. <clears throat> so we'll be discussing this even more later on in my commentary. And now, let's take a Pajola minute. Peace and justice organizations linking arms. Hello, I'm David Stone, board president of the Albuquerque Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Our usual meetings are at 11 a.m. Sundays at the Albuquerque Center for Peace and Justice, but for now, we meet on Zoom. Our website is abquuf.org. My phone number is 505 440-6688. If you'd like to join us, give me a call for the next Zoom meeting number. Again, my number is 505-440-6688. We often have interesting guest speakers, and like the folks at the Center for Peace and Justice, we're all about important issues, current events, and interesting discussions. We're not very churchy, and we won't tell you what to believe, but we'd like to hear what you have to say. So please accept our invitation to join us Sunday mornings at 11, 505-440-6688 is the number to call to get information about our next meeting on Zoom. On Perspectives today, we want to revisit some of the recent legislative achievements at the Roundhouse with the passage of some exciting legislation, including a civil rights bill, a repeal of the ban on abortion, and, legis and the legislation on pot. We want to discuss these things and let's see where we are. So joining us for this discussion today are Director Tom Dent and our legislative guru, <laughs> Steve Gavietis. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. You know, um, we uh, filmed the show at uh, 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening. So with the, with, with the bills that we're going to discuss right now, uh, the top three have not even been signed into law by our governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham. Back in March, uh, the legisl le legislature passed the early ch childhood education bill. And uh, even though she didn't have to sign it, um, Michelle made a point of signing it. It allocated something like $172 million for uh, early childhood education that's desperately needed in the state. So by the time you see the show, hopefully she's signed all three of these bills. Uh, we're worried about one or two, and we'll uh, be discussing that in a moment or two. So Steve, where are we, where are we on all of this? So uh, as Tom as Tom discussed, that um, we're in limbo on, on these right now. We have The governor has one day left to sign a bill. Otherwise, if it doesn't, it's what's called a pocket veto, where she didn't actively say no, but basically let the bill die because there's a shelf life to bills from the legislature. So uh, we have until, she has until Thursday at the end of business to, to, make, a, you know, to make a decision to pass these very good pieces of legislation. Um, so Tom Dan's concern and all of our concern for um, this legislation is, is high. Uh, if you can call the governor's office tomorrow and please plead with the governor to uh, sign these bills, uh, that, that would be crucial to let her know that 
if there's any kind of hesitation she's having from some members of the community, that there's all of us that are in support. Come on, Michelle, don't disappoint us now. Let's get these bills signed. People worked hard to get this legislation passed, and all we need now is your signature. I also, I just want to point out that, uh, at least in the case of the, the Civil Rights Bill, House Bill 4, um, right. you know, this wasn't just anybody's bill. Um, you know, first, it's George Ann Lewis, a great uh, Native American legislator that we have, who signed on it, but the other co-signer co is the Speaker of the House, Brian Egoff. Right. right. So pocket vetoing House Bill 4 would be a slap in the face to the Speaker of the House. Exactly. Uh, and I don't know if that's what Michelle uh, is trying to do here, or insinuate that he really doesn't know anything about this important area of the, of the law. Well, it's a crucial bill, and a number of groups have worked on it. The a ACLU has really touted this bill. Uh, especially with the qualified immunity, we desperately need this bill in New Mexico. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we also know that there was a re repeal of the ban on abortion. Uh, so the Neanderthals have finally been set back on their heels here, I guess. Neanderthal. Haven't we used that word before late, lately here in, in, in this country? I think we <laughs> have. So I'm going to use it here again today. The Neanderthals, you know, have been set back on their heels. You know, who, who in this day and age is still talking about bans on abortion? How stupid. Well, Mississippi is, and, you know, Mississippi can't afford to, to ban abortion. I mean, there, a lot of times New Mexico has been compared to Mississippi for finishing 46th, 50th, and all, all these dreadful ca categories. M Mississippi, you know, has is last in the country in, on unintended pregnancies. It's worse in uh, ne neonatal mortality. It's worse in birth mortality. It's worth, w worse in uh, fem female inactivity. Uh, that that state, you know, it's trying to get rid of abortion altogether, and it's only going to cause multitudes of problems. You may remember when uh, our former vice president Mike Pence was governor of uh, Indiana. One of the things that Agent Orange liked about him is that he and his cronies were going out of their way to try to eliminate Planned Parenthood in Indiana. And uh, they did eliminate it in one community, yeah. and it led to one of the largest HIV outbreaks in this country. And it's kind of like voting uh, voting rights. Um, it's a small cadre of scared right-wing uh, old, uh, old white men who think that they can control this power and that they can control women's bodies. And I, I think also that, you know, I think that's, that's absolutely the case. And then reason number two is that whether they care about that or not, they know that they can control votes by keeping, by beating this issue over and over and over again. Uh, the repeal of this law here in New Mexico would probably be the final nail in this long debated issue of which the, um, the anti-choice folks in New Mexico have been losing steadily, especially in the major cities and overall. Um, so this is really just getting rid of a relic of the past um, and hopefully that will make the issue kind of fall away and we can get on to other very important civil rights issues as well. Yeah, it's been one of their rallying cries for a long time. These so-called white evangelical Christians in particular, like I said, stupid, stupid, stupid. And we're so happy to see that the legislature has passed this bill. And again, we're waiting for the governor to sign the bill. Sign the bill. We're waiting for that. Last one on my list, legalization of pot. That's been a long time coming, too. We've had medical marijuana here for quite a while now, and now we're talking about the legalization of pot. What's happened with that bill? Uh, it's still waiting for the governor to sign it. Uh, you know, it, it passed both houses. It's ready to go. Uh, retail, retail stores are chomping at the bit to make investments. People are still ironing, ironing out the, the different uh, uh, excise tax levels. I believe uh, ours in this bill is 12%, which is uh, compared to Maine. Maine is 10%. Uh, Colorado is 15%. Uh, other states are much higher than that. 
Uh, there were a couple of uh, different tax levels that were proposed uh, primarily by Republicans. One was a 23% that got kind of thrown out the window. One that was almost entertained was Cliff Pirtle's bill for 15%, but he wanted a good chunk of that to go to law enforcement. And there's so much other things Thank that you. have to be covered in this bill. I mean, water rights, uh, land rights, mm -hmm. uh, the way this is taxed, uh, where the money goes to, what it benefits. You know, it needs to go to jobs and ed education in the state. And uh, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, process. And it, it'll probably take at least three legislative sessions to really iron this out. It'll probably take 10 to 20 years to get the system running the way it wants to. But it's looked at other states, and it's got uh, taken very good elements in from other states. It has now raised, compared to last year's bill, the, uh, um, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, God, I can't think of it right now. Um, go ahead, Steve. I, I actually had a question that you might be able to answer, Good. which is that I remember that last year. Um, oh, oh, I know what I'm talking about. It raised last year's uh, bill from, from three plants to six plants that you can have in your home. If you're a couple, you can have... Uh, you can have 12 plants in your home. And the one thing I worry about, you know, because it's not uh, fe federally legalized, you know, I like to grow some in my backyard, and I don't know if a federal plane is going to go over and I'm going to get busted for that. Well, that's where you'll see that uh, all the listings on Zillow that have greenhouses in the backyard, that the price of the houses are going <laughs> to instantly go up. Um, but uh, I, I was going to ask that last year with the big... Uh, cannabis bill that was attempted to pass and there were people, they were having issues on many sides, but one of the things that I saw that was big is, although we were creating a legalization bill, within that bill, we're like over a hundred different ways, new ways to commit a felony. Right. Um, was that uh, was that kind of simmered down a bit? Because it almost became more of a, how can we throw you into jail bill? Yeah, was that ameliorated a bit in this year's bill? Yeah, I, I think a number of those things were, were, were uh, negated from the bill. Like Laura Del Dale was worried about on, on one of her previous programs, she goes like, are we going to turn into ca California that has a lot of hip hidden stipulations for age requirement, the number of plants, um, the, how many ounces you can possess? I believe in this bill you can possess up to two ounces. Uh, it was um, decriminalized last, last year, so mm -hmm. it is legal uh, as long as you don't get caught with more than a half an ounce on you. Okay, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I've, I've heard overall, there, I heard a lot less complaining. I mean, you know, anything this big, it's never going to be perfect, right. and, and we're going to have to iron things out. But compared to last year, the complaining from multiple ends was almost, you know, there was very little. So I, get, I have hope that this bill actually is the best way forward. But once again, Governor, you got to yeah. sign the bill. Right. Well, e e even though it was a, a huge bill originally, 100 and, uh, 830 pages, they twisted a lot of things around from last year. I, I remember speaking directly to uh, Representative uh, Javier Martinez uh, in the legislature last year and catching him on a number of points, and, and they've absolutely reversed uh, uh, five of the key points that, that he was touting last year and, and made this a much better bill. And I apologize. I don't have the bill number. Do you have the bill number? I don't. It, isn't it HB2 or something like that? Uh. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, just ask them to ask, sign call the governor the and ask her to sign the cannabis uh, legalization the bill. Cannabis Regulation Act. Regulation Act. Right. Uh, did we, I'm sorry, did we, could we go back to House Bill 4 for just a second? Sure. Because um, sure. we talked just really briefly about it, but we didn't say what was in it. Yeah. Which was let's uh, do that. House let's Bill 4, one of the biggest parts of the civil, New Mexico Civil Rights Act was a provision removing qualified immunity from police departments here in the state of New Mexico. And this has been a very hotly debated issue within civil rights groups and, and police groups about whether or not that's a good idea. Um, I, for one, I think it's a fantastic idea because what's happened is, is that uh, especially in a, in a case where a police officer would be basically had gone above and beyond mm -hmm. outside of the, the uh, guidelines of police conduct, into criminal conduct. Okay. I'm not talking about civil problems, but criminal cr uh, excessive criminal force. conduct. Like where they yeah. they basically out and out murdered someone, 
similar to what they're talking about in, in Minneapolis right, right now right. with Derek Chauvin, that that when you when you step over that line, that you no longer get the protections from your municipality, mm -hmm. county, state. Uh, you know, you that that's clear because right now, many times the officers get protection um, and get off or get excused, out and out excused, sure. saying that you can't even sue them criminal or take them criminally to to trial. So it took a lot of courage to to uh, to pass that bill. So again, let's get it signed. Well, that's one of the things we're looking for with the new uh, public safety chief, uh, Sylvester Stanley. Hopefully he has the investigative prowess to break the firewall of internal investigations and make sure that these excessive force cases come to the forefront as soon as possible so they don't have time to doctor ev evidence and, and draw these things out to grand juries that are never formed. Another thing uh, uh, that the uh, HB4 does is, and this is in civil cases, but, but it makes the officers get their act and their evidence together as soon as possible because it does allow for uh, any personal damage and attorney fees to be uh, uh, to, ha to have the police uh, uh, department in the city responsible for it. So one of the bills that didn't get passed that I was really pulling for was the public banking bill and our discussion around the, the, the cannabis legislation um, ties right into this, and, and, and Steve and I will get a little more information on this in a minute, but the problem is that the federal government is still anti-cannabis, and because of that, federal banking cannot participate in, you know, as a financial partner with those who are uh, legally, in any state, uh, purveyors of marijuana. And so we were hoping that this public bank, which would mean that the state would have the ability then to, to be a financial partner in the cannabis business, uh, to actually support and make it easier for, for legal banking to happen. So I reached out to um, uh, a colleague of mine who was very much involved in the, uh, the, the public banking uh, legislation that did not get passed, and we hope that they come back and, and, and try that again in January. But uh, she sent me a little comment here, and I'm just going to share this with you. The cannabis revenues will be in search of depositories since cannabis cannot be, uh, is still considered uh, illegal at the federal level, and those funds cannot be deposited in federal banks. As we have proposed, the state public bank would not be a retail bank, but deposits initially would only be state deposits. Later, other governmental entities may also make deposits, but not commercial businesses, so we'd have to work that little piece out, Steve, as well. The function, even as a depository for cannabis revenue, would require additional staffing and special retail bank-oriented software that would significantly raise the cost of a public bank startup and also contribute to higher costs of compliance and regulation. I had a lengthy conversation with Representative Andrea Romero on this topic prior to or early in the last legislative session. As the paragraph explains, in the case of cannabis revenues, our new public bank would be limited by how it's written. I know that a lot of effort and time went into writing the bill in order to increase its possibilities of getting support and passing. I think that the part about accepting only state deposits was one of the ways to ensure that community banks would not be able to claim unfair competition, which they did anyway. If you remember, they're opposing arguments. But this issue, revenues from legalized cannabis being deposited into a public bank are being discussed in other states in the country because it's a pressing and urgent issue. Here's a link, and they provided us with a link here. We could probably put this up later to an interesting article about Public Banking Institute and the website that you can go to, which I hope that you find uh, will be helpful. Let me know, let us know where we can gather additional information. 
So Steve, I know I mentioned this to you earlier, and you were talking about possible alternatives to uh, even a public state bank. Right, and you know, Tom and I had a, a very brief and uh, uh, pointed discussion on Facebook uh, when we were talking about this as well. Um, when you brought up the idea that that we should go to our legislature and ask them to, to enact a state bank, which, by the way, I, I'm in favor of for many reasons, not just because of the cannabis thing. Right. Um, there's there there could be many benefits, um, even intergovernmental benefits to a state bank. Absolutely. Um, and so uh, we can keep more of our money here and not going to Wall Street in San <clears throat> Francisco. And so um, I'm 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 for that. But the fact is, it's just like a lot of other legislation. It takes forever to happen. Yeah. We keep pleading. We keep pleading with our legislators to do the right thing, and you see how hard it is to, to get legislators to do the right thing. When now we have an alternative banking system, you know, in the cryptocurrency universe with Bitcoin, um, and there's even one out there I was telling uh, Tom about Potcoin, which has been around forever, and there's many others like it, but I mentioned Potcoin because they cater themselves to the cannabis industry. Um, but you know, you could use basically anything. And if you had, if your companies had their own wallets, you know, and you still do all the accounting and whatever, and you do peer-to-peer -peer transactions between, um, you know, growers, uh, retailers, um, buyers, uh, using that kind of thing, then then all of those transactions are just done, you know, between each other. You still have to account for it and everything, pay your taxes and whatnot. But uh, and there's software and everything to do that. And um, that's what I was telling Tom, you know, like, why don't we just forget begging these legislators yeah. to do the right thing and just use the alternative systems? Um, they're still smoothing them out. They're getting better by the year, the, the way they can transactions work and everything. Um, and with more adoption, of course, will come more development of the. But yeah, I, I really feel like there's no need like there. You can already bypass all of that mm -hmm. and, and not worry about the federal regulations. And I was a little bit worried about that. I guess it's my ignorance about cryptocurrency. I guess I was watching, uh, what's his name, Chris Krebs, the uh, Homeland Security Director who's supposed to be a cyber <coughs> security expert or something like that. And he goes like, oh, Bitcoin and data mining are dangerous because uh, you uh, utilizes an open field in Russia and there's all this pinging and it goes into people's unsecure accounts and sets up ransomware and it really uh, puts uh, some school, schools and hospitals in danger. And then Chris, uh, uh, Steve went back to me and said, uh, don't listen to those guys. You need, you need to understand what's going on. You need to understand the details of this. But it does sound like a interesting viable alternative and we could have another show where we talk about cryptocurrency in detail yeah and by the way i will tell you this that anywhere where where money and transactions are involved in the world there will be thieves and liars and, and criminals but there's also just people who are doing their honest business as well i mean that happens with our dollars as well and that happens with shell companies and and fraud and whatnot so there's nothing really any different in that sense. You do have to be careful. And with crypto, especially if you're using your own custodial wallet, right. it is your wallet, your banking, you're the bank. You can be your own bank. But that also means that you have to make sure you send the money to the right place, that you get the right, you have to do all the things that the bank would do. You're only, the upside for that is you don't pay the absorb, exorbitant fees. So yeah, there, you, you, it's not, um, you know, everyone needs to do their due diligence and do everything right. But I think that there's a lot of, uh, and the more I think that, that like I said, the more manu um, suppliers, growers, retailers, and users, um, uh, customers all uh, start adopting that, it becomes very fluid. Well, I'm, I'm all for looking for alternatives because I know that so many of the systems that are in place have been, a system, have been in place for such a long time. They're old, they're out of date, they're wonky, and, and believe me, they're not as secure as they would have us believe either. So, I mean, it's, it's a crapshoot in terms of, of, of uh, taking a, a risk on security here, but it's an alternative that could have tremendous advantages you know, to any of us. So uh, I'm looking into cryptocurrency, and maybe you should as well. You know. Redistricting. There was a bill on redistricting. 
Let's see what's happening with that. Anybody look into that bill? Yeah, so there's a, um, there, uh, and it was signed by the governor, uh, uh, I think either today of this filming or uh, yes, the day right. before. The um, day and before. Yeah. It's called like a Citizens Redistricting Commission. And what it has uh, created is a system where instead of initially when it's time for redistricting, especially for state legislature, and Congress, the things that the legislature takes care of, uh, that instead of the legislators drawing their own districts and you know uh, doing what they want, that now redistricting goes first to a citizens uh, redistricting commission. Um, and I've not studied all, it, it's bipartisan, uh, which of course we can talk about independents and third party right. people, but um, that they will come together and draw plans up for each of the things that need to be done. What House, Senate, Legislative, um, Congress, uh, we don't have to worry about PRC anymore, um, and uh, maybe Public Education Commission. And then they will submit those plans to the legislature for adoption. Now, in some other states, the legislature does not get to have a say. The independent commission uh, is fully in charge of doing that. In this bill, it was watered down a bit, and so the legislature will receive the plans, but they still have the ability to draw their own. Mm -hmm. They can accept or reject the plans from the Citizens Commission, and then, and then you go forward from there. So it's not perfect. It's not, it's, like I said, it's a little weak, but it's a step in the right direction at least you know, having some direct input from outside the legislative body. Um, and the hope is that um, when you do a citizen's commission, they're less worried about the peculiar individual needs uh, or wants, I should say, of a legislator. Um, and, yeah. and, um, and that they may draw districts that are a little bit more cohesive with communities of interest, you know. And that's... Um, and it's been shown throughout the country where there, there are these things. And by the way, you know, ones that are also like bipartisan and blah, that uh, many times that's exactly what they do, is they draw um, less squiggles. They, they tend to, to divide communities uh, up if they don't have to. Um, they don't care quite as much if they put two legislators in the same district, if the district itself looks good. Um, so that would be the hope. Now, whether a legislative body would accept a plan like that would be another story. But even that will be an interesting case study to see whether um, whether the legislature will allow that to you know uh, that to happen, or if they'll devolve back to um, to being more um, thinking more about themselves. But you know, so I think that whole process it will it'll be new. It'll be interesting to watch um, as it proceeds. That's exciting, though, because you know at least some safeguards are. They're talking about putting some safeguards in place where um, communities, in fact, will possibly have some input, mm -hmm. and and we can't see this this punitive kind of redistricting, you know, that we hear talk about, you know, every ten years around the country, where you know whatever party is in charge is going to make certain that the lines are redrawn you know, just to benefit that party's advantage. We can only hope that that's going to happen here. Right. And, the, oh, go ahead. The communities need to be involved like they really need to be involved in the Gateway Center and, and the neighborhoods uh, by the Loveless Medical Center. And like you're talking about, and like you're going to talk about more later, you know, Jerry, redistricting is basically gerrymandering, which is part of the toolkit of these people that want to suppress your vote. That's true. Right. Yeah, and we do have some, I would say that in our state, we have some particular um, things that complicate redistricting that don't exist in some other states. We have Native American lands. We have majority Hispanic areas and um, court orders, especially to respect um, uh, districts that need to have a certain percentage of those populations in them. Sometimes that creates some squiggles that you wouldn't have normally, but it, it's in protection mm -hmm. of, of minority voting groups. Um, although this last time, uh, the Supreme Court has, um, has I, can't, I, I hope I get this right. I think they've said that, that you can redistrict, you can gerrymander on the basis of political party all you want. The, the, the um, minority group one is still 
um, somewhat to be respected, although maybe a little weakened. But in our state, um, back in 2019-90, there were plans drawn that uh, Native American groups objected to. Mm -hmm. They won every single time. All right. So, All right. so it's become very clear that there are certain things that you cannot uh, violate in doing our redistricting. And, and uh, speaking of Native American, when I was looking at the last minute to see if uh, our governor had signed these three or four key bills, I noticed that she did sign a bill allocating uh, $60 million in Native American, uh, Native, uh, Native American education outside of the re reservations. Fantastic, fantastic. So we've got a few minutes left uh, in, in, in this particular segment, and I just wanted to know if there are any other pieces of legislation or anything legislative-esque that we want to touch upon. Oh, boy. No, I, when you were talking about the Georgia thing, I had a couple oh. opinions about that. <laughs> Is there anything about, uh, about uh, the fracking bills failed, right? The anti-fracking bills? Uh, yeah, nothing like that. And, was there anything about renewable energy and less dependence on the, oil and gas? The Community Solar Act passed. That's right. Um, That's right. And so, and has been signed by the governor. Good. So yes, it is good. It's a step in the right direction. Um, <clears throat> some of the, um, I would say, cottage industry, small group, solar folks felt like um, there was a little bit too much given to uh, larger utilities in the bill. But again, uh, you know, it's a step in the right direction, and I guess this is how we're going to have to proceed in the New Mexico legislature: is taking these little nibbles towards the right, the right direction. So, what did it do for us? What did that 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 bill do? I, you know, I did not study it thoroughly. I, I was watching more like the, the horse race of whether it was going to pass or not. Right. Uh, right. And um, did it did it give uh, tax relief credits for solar? I believe in, in uh, an ability to negotiate better for. Uh, but I, I don't have expertise. I wish there area. was a grandfather clause because I put my solar panels up under Susanna Martinez and I was out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> you can get your credits, state credits, right now if you put solar up. Yeah, I, I've, I've got solar and you know, and didn't cost me anything. So there was a, obviously some plan in place a, yeah. a few years ago that uh, uh, permitted solar companies to to come and at the expense of P and M. Um, and with some government subsidies, I guess, install solar panels on people's homes, right. and uh, I'm all the better for it. Yeah. And by the way, uh, one last crypto note, because I'm a crypto miner. Right. I actually, <laughs> through using uh, computer hardware to mine, which uses a lot of electricity, and so nearly everyone I know who's a crypto miner, their end goal is to be a solar crypto miner, yeah. so that their net that they're net zero on the, the the electricity for using it, which then takes that argument uh, away from from the efficacy of crypto. And that's another thing I said on 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 my podcast when I talked about the cannabis legislation. Be great if we'd uh, have more solar farms to power our pot farms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, sometimes I, I I find myself driving in the southeastern part of the state where they're just massive open fields and not even a lot of farming going on there. And I just imagine what it could be like if we had solar farms and wind farms taking up that space, what it could do to just, you could power the whole state of New Mexico with very little effort, oh, I think. It, you not only power the whole state of New Mexico, because our, our population and industry is small, we would yeah. we would be selling, selling our energy, energy yeah. outwards. We would yeah. export it out. Yeah. And so, you know, this could be a productive resource just like uh, marijuana, or cannabis, excuse me. And yeah, we, we could be the Permian Basin and the solar. There's no reason why that can't be. Okay, let that be the message to the solar and mm. wind industries out here. Let's get a move on and let's see what we yeah. can do to expand. And P&M, we're coming for you. And it can dovetail into President Biden's $2 trillion uh, infrastructure plan very nicely if they pass it, if they can get the votes. We can only hope. Let's, let's do what we can. Let's do what we can to uh, see to it that that legislation gets passed as well. You know, there's a lot on the, on the, uh, on the burners out here, and there are just so many opportunities that we can, in fact, uh, take advantage of. 
um, in, in, as we move forward. So, so I'll, I'll just say real quick that, so in an overall, like if you look at the legislative session overall, including the special, and by the way, I, I need to eat crow. I have been telling people I know and prognosticating that the governor would never sign the cannabis bill. Now, she hasn't signed it. She hasn't signed but it yet. Her campaign promise, which I always thought was qualified when she ran for governor, she says, I will sign a, can a cannabis bill if it gets to my desk. And that if, to me, was always big. I'm like, yeah, she's never going to let one get to her desk. Well, there's one on her desk now. Yeah. So you have a direct campaign promise from the campaign trail that you would sign this bill. Please honor your word, Governor Lujan Grisham. All right, Governor, we're watching you. Sign the bills. We need that. We really do. All right. We've got some good news. We've got some bad news. But let's get some more good news. Let's go to Hassani with Good News News. Good morning and welcome to Good News News. I'm your correspondent, Hassani Olujimi, and I'm Goo Goo for Good News. Now, the goal of this segment is to inspire and uplift you, the viewer, with nothing but good news. So let's jump right in. Our first story goes like this. For the seventh year in a row, the shop's owner, Peter Thomas, has been the driving force behind Coffee with a Purpose, an annual community initiative that collects and distributes coats and other necessities to the homeless population to brave the cold and harsh Midwest winters. Thomas says making the donations one-on-one -on -one makes it feel more genuine. You never know where anyone has been or what they have been through before meeting you. We treat the homeless the same and equal. According to Thomas's proud mother, Joni Morgan, she says ever since her son was a little boy, he would always find outsiders and pull them in and make them feel welcome. In the first year, they brought in over 3,000 coats. Thomas says he sees coffee as the perfect metaphor to inspire positive action. He goes further to say, I'm fueling them and caffeinating them to do something better, something that will make them feel good about themselves. And then we all can grow together as one big coffee family and fly beyond greatness. Now, isn't that good news? All right, Thomas. I could use a cup of coffee, too. Would you like to warm this one up? Thank you. Be a doll. <laughs> Our next story goes a little bit like this. Here we go. Andrea Lessing was at work at the Goodwill Industries in Norman, Oklahoma, where she found stacks of $100 bills folded up in two donated sweaters. The cash totaled, you can guess, $42,000. Mm -hmm. Andrea was in the back sorting clothes and looking for rips and stains when she found the money. The first thing she thought was, oh! My daughter's birthday is coming up in July, and I can actually give her an amazing birthday, she told the local news. Andrea says that she believes in karma and couldn't imagine keeping the money for herself. She reported the lost cash, and the store was <laughs> the store was able to track down the owner. We thinking the same thing, audience. Mm -hmm, I feel you. So the store tracked down the owner thanks to some identifying documentation that was bundled up with the money. The owners who had forgotten about the money when they donated the sweaters gave Andrea a thousand dollars. Andrea says that she made the right decision. If you do something good, something good will come back to you. Isn't that good news? Better than a $1,400 check, but we can take what we can get. Thank you. <laughs> now, I got another story. You want to hear it? Here we go. This is a good one, too. Retired seniors have revealed their top 40 pearls of wisdom to pass on to younger generations. The poll of 1,000 retired adults also advise young people, people, excuse me, to never compare themselves to others and to phone their families once a week. The questionnaire found 67% of retirees do have regrets. 
not traveling the world, worrying about what other people say and think, and not keeping physically fit. A spokesman for the commission says that it's been interesting to see the insight and wisdom the older generation would like to pass on to today's youth, such as the following tips. Treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. Be confident in your own skin. Do what makes you, ha makes you happy. Invest in property. Say I love you more. Exercise often. Remember the compliments you receive. That's really good. And two last ones. Laugh more at everything and appreciate your younger body. Now see, I could do that last one, appreciate my younger body. I just don't know where it is. <laughs> now, I have a special guest today I would like to introduce you to. Her name is Little Big Mama. I'm sure you will enjoy her company. Take it away, Little Big Mama. Thank you, Hassani. I just have two riddles for your viewers today. What do you call a cow with three legs? Lean beef. <laughs> now, what do you call a bear with no teeth? A gummy bear. <laughs> Back to you, baby. <laughs> Thank you, little big mama. As we always say, the best way to turn a frown upside down is to get goo goo for good news. I'm your correspondent, Hassani Olujimi, special guest, little big mama. We'll see you right back here on that Saturday show with more good news. This week, Georgia is on my mind, along with a reported 43 states all taking steps to turn back the clock on voting rights in this country, where African Americans in particular have been able to realize some small but significant gains in our quest for equal rights. Sixty years ago, I joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, to, to, to participate in a remarkable and challenging journey to bring voting rights to African Americans across the South. It now appears that the long-held Southern strategy to marginalize us is again spreading much like the COVID virus that is gripping this country. This racist disease that is infecting the nation is the product of years of people in power still fighting the old civil war as if it never ended. Guess what? It hasn't ended. And I've witnessed firsthand the sick and perverted ways it continues. When Republicans control either chamber of Congress, it is always Southerners who chair the key committees that make the critical decisions that impact our lives. Ronald Reagan launched his presidential campaign in Mississippi, thumbing his nose at blacks everywhere. George W. Bush used the Voting Rights Act in an effort to win black support for his reelection, only to have the Supreme Court gut the Voting Rights Act a few years later. And then Trump, I hate saying his name, made it all right for the racists inside and outside of the government to show their racism without hesitation. And now, 43 states and 250 pieces of legislation are all in play to prevent black folks from voting and to ensure that the Republicans gain the upper hand in future elections. You see, they can't win in an honest election, so they've got to cheat because they know they're wrong. The Civil War still rages on, and after 60 years, I see myself coming full circle once again, fighting the voting, for voting rights and defending other liberties we are entitled to. Will it take freedom rides? Will it take boycotts? Will it take massive demonstrations? Will it take the passage of the pending John Lewis bill in Congress? Will it take this and more? 
the white supremacist party, yeah, that's what I've named them now, formerly known as the GOP, has become a criminal enterprise filled with racism and hypocrisy, and the only response to their evil agenda is to crush them. After 60 years of struggle, I am not inclined to tolerate the return of the same old crap that I and so many of us work so hard to put an end to. I urge all freedom-loving people everywhere to take a stand and use whatever means necessary to stop the rising tide of racism from showing its ugly head again. You may see a bus parked outside the Peace and Justice Center soon, encouraging people to get on that bus and head to Atlanta or head to Arizona or wherever else they're trying to take our liberties. The Civil War is over. The race is lost, and it's time we remind them of that. I'm Jim Harvey, and this is The Saturday Show. All right. Cheryl Sharps. Cheryl Sharps is bringing us our music for today's show. Cheryl arrived in Albuquerque in 1998, where she initially was pulled into the musical theater as an accompanist. Oh, that's a hard word to say. As an accompanist at Albuquerque Little Theater. I love that place. Although her love for music started in high school back in Indiana, she went on to attend Indiana University and focused on six years of piano lessons and accompanying and earned a BA and an MA in audiology. Since Cheryl's arrival in Albuquerque, she has continued her work as an accompanist for musical theater, including, including Musical Theater Southwest, Landmark Musicals, I love that place, Adobe Theater, and so much more. She's currently working on a production called A Killer Party, while she continues teaching piano part-time for the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Cheryl is an incredible keyboardist, and she's bringing you music to close out our show today. I bring you Cheryl Sharps. The song Someone Like You from the musical Jekyll and Hyde is sung by the character Lucy, a performer in a pub with plenty of other service girls. Dr. Jekyll formally met Lucy at this pub and offered her help after she was roughed up by her boss for being late. Now the good doctor bandages Lucy's wounds that were inflicted by his altered self, Mr. Hyde. Lucy and Dr. Jekyll develop feelings after she has felt his protection and friendship and love like none other. She sings this song in reflection. Thank you. 
Until the next time, it's time to say goodbye. When you out here in the streets, keep it real, 505. We love everybody. We just want to let you know. Thanks for tuning in to that Saturday show.